Great to see good evening, everyone. My name is Sam Thompson. I am the program manager for UK scholars here at the US UK Fulbright Commission. Uh, so I'm in charge of programs for UK Scholar Awards, which is what this webinar is for, as well as the Distinguished Teachers Program, uh, Richard Allen Award, and, and other programs um, related to scholars and professionals in the UK going to the US. And I'm joined tonight by one of our current Fulbrighters, Catherine Harrison, who I will uh, allow to introduce herself, and then we'll get onto the topic of the webinar this evening. Catherine, if you'd like yeah, to thanks. say a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Dr. Catherine Harrison, and I'm um, a senior lecturer at Leeds Beckett University. Uh, and I've just been lucky enough to be the recipient of um, the, the Fulbright Smithsonian Scholar Award. So I've only very recently been through the application process, which is why I think Sam hoped that I'd have some insights uh, to share with you. And I haven't actually taken my trip to the USA yet. I'm going um, later uh, in, in 2022, actually. Um, so uh, I, I'm, yeah, I'm very much still fresh from the application and haven't yet uh, be, been on my own trip. And and also someone who um, has uh, always impressed our uh, our applicant panelists and, and um, the staff that have read your application. So we figured you're a really good example to talk about uh, the application itself. Um, so before we get started, uh, a little bit on tonight. Tonight we're going to be talking about submitting a competitive application. So what it is that you can do to really um, up your chances of of getting shortlisted, uh, making your application compelling and if you've not started yet, what you can do to make this process as, as easy as possible for yourself, take out any of that stress. Uh, we understand it can be an overwhelming and intimidating process, but it, it doesn't need to be. And we're here to try and give you some advice to make sure that that's the case, that you're able to, to get this done to a standard that you're happy and proud of, and that uh, it will be well received by our reviewers and staff here at the US UK Fulbright Commission. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. We are recording tonight's webinar, so if you aren't able to stay for the whole hour, or if you missed something and you think, oh, they said something really helpful, but uh, I don't I don't quite remember what it was, you will be able to go back to this on our YouTube. We hope to get it up by the end of the week, if not early next week. So it will be available to you on demand as soon as possible. It also means if you missed tonight, or uh, if you've got a colleague or a friend who is also applying for an award, you will be able to share this recording with them if you found it useful. Uh, another piece of, of housekeeping is we are using captions tonight, so if you find that that makes tonight more accessible for yourself, please turn on captions. They are auto captions, so they aren't the most reliable at times, but it may it may help you follow along with what's being said. And finally, if you have questions, please use the Q&A box, we'll be checking it, and as we're, we're going to be keeping a, a fairly conversational style this evening, it may be that you have a question that's relevant at the time that drives the conversation to a place that helps everyone. So don't be afraid of asking questions as we go. Uh, but if not, we'll have some time at the end for any questions. So thank you for all of that. Uh, so getting an application together, as, as I said, I don't think it's too late if you're just starting now to get your application together. Uh, if you're in the middle of your application, then you may find some of these tips helpful too, because there's a there's still time to, to really refine that application and get it sorted. Um, our deadline is not until the 8th of November, so plenty of time to get those, those finishing touches in there, any refinements you want to make, any updates. Uh, so really don't worry about where you are in the application stage. We will try and make sure these tips are as relevant to you as possible. But in the, uh, in the vein of if you've not started yet or you're still pretty fresh in the process, I did want to talk about getting started on the application, first of all. So when it comes to applying, uh, you can apply by heading to our website looking for how to apply and there will be a link to the application form there. It is an online application through apply.iie.org, I believe is the link. Um, this should be where you go to fill out the application. As you as you will notice, it is not uh, a .org.uk or a Fulbright address. It's, it's through IIE who are our partners in the US who administer the US side of the application. And that's going to be really important for what I think of as the golden rule of applying to a, a Fulbright award, which is follow the instructions. If you go to our website, there is a PDF on the how to apply page with a, a, a very comprehensive set of uh, instructions for our application form. And these are specific to the UK Scholar Award applications. And that's really important because the application form you will be filling out is an international application form uh, that is the same application form that applicants from Fulbright commissions and embassies all over the world will see. 
which means that it's not tailored to what we at the US-UK Fulbright Commission need or are looking for. So if you want to submit an application that has everything you need and is going to be competitive, the best thing to do is read those specific UK instructions so that you can make sure you're not missing anything. Your application is going to be eligible and you're going to have the best chances that you can have. Every year we get the same questions about this process and a lot of them can be so answered by pointing at that instruction document. So take the stress out of this process, go to those instructions, read them, uh, and internalize them, have them saved and, and up on your screen for when you're filling out your application, because there we've written them for the process and, and for the purpose of you using them. And it will, it will take a lot of hassle out of things if you are looking at them so you're not confused about different steps in the application. I also want to emphasize that there are multiple awards available. You'll see those on our website on the awards available section. And applying for the right award can be an edge in this process. We have various partner awards. Catherine here is, is our Fulbright Smithsonian Scholar Award. And uh, when I say there's a competitive edge to applying to these, we typically have fewer applications for our scholar awards, be, for our partner awards, because they are more specific. They're, they're often targeted at specific fields or specific institutions or uh, specific professional bodies. And, and what that means is that there will be fewer people applying for them. The All Disciplines Award is a, is a broad and open category. And that means that it's gonna have the most applications. Sure, there are a few more awards in the All Disciplines category, but you're going to be competing with the most other people. So when it comes to getting shortlisted, if you're eligible for a uh, for a partner award, consider applying for one because there is a little bit of an edge there to be gained in terms of thinking about how many people am I going to be competing against. I also recommend uh, using every bit of the application. Uh, there is a lot to fill out there, and I think when looking at the application form, it can be a, a little bit easy to think who's going to who's going to be checking every bit of this. But we have multiple reviewers. Uh, we have our academic review panels who will be reading the project side and the, the uh, CV side. And then myself and, uh, and other staff of the Fulbright Commission will be looking for those Fulbright aspects, which means that we're, we're taking as holistic an approach to your application as possible. But what that also means is that things won't go unnoticed. So if you're making use of every section of the application to, to highlight different aspects of why you're a good candidate, we will be paying attention and someone will pick up on that and that will make a make an impact on on those reading your application and, and could go on to have a, a positive impact on your uh, application process. Catherine, is there anything that, that I've missed in the getting started that you think would be helpful or you wish you'd known starting off this process? Um, I think I think Sam, I just really reiterate your advice about reading the instructions because I think initially I felt a little bit overwhelmed um, with with the volume of guidance. Um, but when you have read it a couple of times and sort of worked out how you're going to map that onto your um, project proposal specifically, it becomes really helpful. So what seems at the beginning to be an awful lot of information later on becomes a really useful way of structuring um, your proposal and, and sort of having a checklist to make sure you've done all the things that you need to do. And, and on that note, in this year's application instruction document, we actually have a checklist um, that's that's got all of the things that, that are being looked for and, and it's unmarked so you can go through and, and make sure you've, you've hit all of those key points. Uh, so do make use of that if, if you find it useful. And uh, I, I think you've you've hit on a really important idea there of, of boiling it down to those key things that you need to do. Granted, there are there are more aspects of the application to fill, for you to fill out than these, but a, a good place to start is, is my, is my academic CV up to date? Is my project proposal uh, complete and, and well communicated? Do I have evidence of communication with the, um, with the desired host institution? And have I reached out to, to my refer referees and reminded them that they need to complete the references before the deadline? And as I've said, use all of the applications so there will be more to do than just those things. But if you're hitting those points, that's a really good starting place to be is, is make sure you've done those things. And I, and I imagine what we'll do is we'll now get into going through each of those and, uh, and share some tips that we have. So the, the first thing, when you're going through the application is you'll you'll have all of your regular 
application form stuff to fill out. Um, so a lot of this is, is less relevant to what we're reviewing, but just make sure you've got it in place. These are things like your contact details and, and such. But within this, there's also information that you provide that is really useful for, uh, for what we're looking for. So early on, you'll be asked to provide aspects of your professional profile. These are things like professional accomplishments, honors, and achievements. And although this is a, a relatively short bit of the application, it's something that people will be looking for. And if you think about what the Fulbright Award is, it's not just an academic award. It's, it's an award that looks at cultural curiosity, ambassadorial, quality, uh, lead, ambassadorial qualities, and leadership qualities. The, this is a great opportunity to uh, show off some of those things that maybe don't necessarily come across in your CV or your project because your CV maybe focuses on your publications and what you're teaching and your project focuses on the project itself. So this is a great opportunity to highlight, these are the things I'm really proud of that I've done recently and I think exemplify why I'm, why I'm a, good, uh, a good person to select for the award. Similarly, there's uh, other, other aspects of, of that side of the application that you can fill out to, to emphasize other bits of your professional background that, that may continue to augment this, this part of your award. So we have things like organizational memberships, um, your, your various uh, education employment background, language skills, things like that. So, so make sure you are putting in the detail there and highlighting the things that you want us to be aware of because we are reading these bits of the application. It's not just all about the proposal and the CV. Once you've done that, we, we get to the section on the project proposal. Now, you will have the opportunity to submit your full project proposal as a, the, that you've worked on outside of the online application form. But there's also a, an early on bit of the application where you are asked to submit information about your project. So this is a project title, a brief summary of your project proposal, and uh, then some, some information about the logistics of the project. So proposed length in months, proposed start dates, um, and, and whether you've made affiliation with your US institution or not. I really wanna emphasize that this brief summary of your project proposal is really important. We'll talk about actually communicating the project in the main proposal section, but I think if you can sum up your project in a couple of hundred words, like you're allowed in the space here in a way that is going to stick in people's memories and that is going to be understood both by academic readers and Fulbright readers. It means that we will be thinking about your application once we're, once we're done reading. It will be able to think about your project and talk about your project and it will stick with us in a, in a way that a really solid academic proposal, but that isn't necessarily communicated well in a concise manner might not. So really think about how can I elevator pitch my project to the people reading this, especially the people who aren't necessarily from the same background as me. I, and, and also um, thinking about a title that's that's going to, to be impactful as well. Catherine, I, I think you did a, a really good job in this section. So have you got any advice on getting that concise version of a proposal together? Yeah, well, I think the first thing I'd say is, is just to be aware that there are word limits in that section of the form. So I think when I had my first stab at it, I hadn't quite realised that there was specific sort of a word limit. So um, I definitely advise sort of writing that section on a Word document and pasting it into the, <laughs> this is really basic advice, but sort of I, I sort of started doing it free form and then found I'd exceeded the limit and then forgotten what I was trying to do. So a bit of a bit of advanced planning. Um, and I also think um, th this really is the, the hook section, isn't it? it? It's the bit where you're trying to um, attract attention to your application. Um, so there's no reason why you can't slightly repeat that section in the project proposal because there are sections that echo this, but it's the, the eye-catching part, the bit where you want uh, the, 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 the judges um, to be really interested in, in your projects and be, be bothered to, to read it in a much more detail. Yeah, I, I know that when I'm reading applications, there are gonna be bits inevitably in the long form proposal that, that I'm not gonna understand. I, I can't possibly be qualified in 
to the degree that I need to be in, in every area that people are applying from. But if this early bit is, is communicated well, I'm certainly going to be more open to reading through those sections. Uh, and also, I, I, I assure you, I'm not the only person reading these applications. I have academic reviewers who are reviewing the bits that I'm not going to get. But putting your time into the bits that people are going to understand and, and making sure you're communicating why your project is important and what people should care about is, is crucial, I think, to this, this section of the application. From there, uh, we move on to university affiliations. Uh, if you're applying for a partner award, this may be a requirement of your partner award that you're affiliated with a specific institution. So for instance, our Smithsonian award, you should be affiliated with one of the Smithsonian institutions. Our Elon award, you have to be affiliated with Elon University. But for something like our All Disciplines award, you're able to uh, uh, create an affiliation with any university uh, that is accredited in the United States. You should be doing this in advance. And if you've not got a full letter of support to submit, at least submit evidence of communication, whether that's uh, screenshots of an email thread or a quick letter from an academic colleague at that university. But make sure you've been thinking about this already because an application without any affiliation, while we may take the time to read it, is not nearly as convincing as one that does have an affiliation. There is room for multiple affiliations, but most projects will only be affiliated with a single university. And if you're either in the middle of an application and trying to get it done or don't have much time to finish it, or even just trying to communicate a really strong idea, having that focus of having worked with a single institution and getting the backing of a focused institution that is relevant and important to your studies is gonna be a really, a really compelling bit of the application to read as well. So make sure you're working on that affiliation section. Now, uh, the, the first bit of really detailed work in the application is your academic CV. You will have academic CVs that will look different. You should already have uh, an academic CV at, at this point if you're looking to apply. So it will be a case of, of adding this to the application form rather than working on something brand new. But make sure that you're, you're thinking about how you want your academic CV read. First thing that, that I, I can advise is make sure it's up to date. Make sure that everything you want to be on there is on there and make sure it is in an order that you want to be read. Make sure it's, it's accurate. Make sure it's clear and well communicated. And then think about, am I ordering this in a way that is going to be read well for what I'm applying for? So Am I emphasizing my teaching, for instance, if you're going for something like the Elon Award where teaching is really important, or are you going for a pure research award where you want your research to, to come to the fore? Think about what it is in your CV you want people to, to pay attention to, especially if you have a, a number of applications and can only, or a number of publications, sorry, and can only provide a short list or, or a list of highlights. Make sure you're including ones that are recent and relevant uh, our academic review panels pay a lot of attention to the academic CV. So making sure you've put your time into getting everything in there that you want to be in there and making sure it's, it's clearly communicated that there is no errors in there is, is, is something that it will pay dividends in the application stage because this is a part of the application that is really vital. Uh, I've not I've not had to write one of these myself. So Catherine, is there any advice that you can give to someone when putting together an academic CV? Yeah, um, if I remember correctly, Sam, um, there is a page number limit, isn't there, on the CV that you may there submit? There is, yeah. Yeah, so um, what, once again, my, my uh, pitfall was that I had, I had imagined I could simply upload the latest version of my academic CV, but then mm. realised quite quickly that it, it exceeded five pages. So um, I think Sam is is really it's really useful advice to think about. First, it's, it may well be a truncated form of, of CV compared to the one that you'd submit for, for example, for a job application. And also, it's not necessarily speaking to the same audience as a job application. So absolutely tailoring it so that in my case, I think I put research a little bit higher up than it, it would on my sort of job, job application um, CV because my my award was was very much research orientated right. i think um you said something there that i was going to pick up on and and i i hope it will come back to me 
um, oh, that's right. Um, it's truncated. And I was going to say in different fields, publications happen in different um, rates. So in some STEM fields, because a lot of um, there are a lot of times you'll be public making publications where it will be part of a research group. So your name will be on a lot more publications, say, than in some humanities or social sciences fields where people will often publish um, individually. So the rate of publication might be a little bit slower. Again, if, you're, if your name is appearing on lots of publications, think about the ones that are going to stand out and the ones that are relevant to your, um, to your project proposal, if there are more than that you can fit onto the form. Uh, and we've had a question that is relevant to this stage of the application, which is, um, do you have a preference for a particular career stage and are early career researchers encouraged to apply? We don't have a preference for any given career stage and we absolutely encourage early career researchers to apply. And I, I want to make it clear that even though there is a lot of emphasis put on the academic CV, it's, it's about quality, not quantity. And if you're an early career researcher who doesn't have a lot of publications, who doesn't have years and years of teaching, that's okay. We're still going to read your application with the same level of detail that we read everyone else's application. Every year we, we give a number of awards to early career researchers and um, I encourage you to go and look at our website on the Meet Our Fulbrighters section because you'll be able to see there's a really diverse range of career stages represented in our, in our cohorts. So if you're worried that perhaps you've not yet got that experience or background in your career to this point and that your CV maybe has less on it than someone who's at the later stages of their career, I really don't let that be an obstacle to your applying um, because there will be other things that you can do in terms of maybe you've got a really compelling project proposal, maybe you've got uh, a really good support from your institution. There are lots of other things in your application that will come up. And, and whilst we're here, uh, I've received a question that says, does the same go for PhD students? It, it can. Uh, I want to be clear that there is a, an eligibility issue when it comes to PhD students you will need to have received your PhD and completed it. So completed your PhD research and, and Viva and have received your PhD by the time that you would start your Fulbright Award. So you can still be doing your PhD while you're writing the application. But if you would start uh, your Fulbright Award in the project you've proposed to us before you've actually received your PhD, you would no longer be eligible. So make sure you've got that timing piece down in terms of when you would want to go to the US. All right, so our next, uh, our next bit of the application is the project proposal itself. So this, this kind of has two angles for me, which is, I like to think of this section because this is the section where we get the most writing from the applicant. I also think of the section where I'm reading the application in two different regards, which is the academic view and the Fulbright view. So is this proposal academically sound? Is it viable? Is it having an impact? You, all of those things that you would think about in a, in a typical grant form, in an in a application for any kind of academic project. But also we're thinking about this from a Fulbright perspective. So why do you need to go to the US? Is your reason for going to the US compelling and integral to the project? Are you going to be engaging in the com in wider communities when you're in the US? Uh, what's, your, what's your engagement going to be like in terms of cultural curiosity, ambassadorial qualities? Remember when you're doing a Fulbright Award, it's not just about the research, it's about the Fulbright mission. So being a representative for the UK, learning more about US culture. And, and those things are crucial to this section. We're also looking at leadership and how this project will develop you as a person. So there's two different angles to think about when you're writing this, and that's really important. But you also have to remember that you're writing for both of those audience when it comes to the communication piece. So you're writing for academics in your field who will be reviewing this application. So you, you are allowed to go into detail, you're allowed to go into depth, in your academic field, but also you are writing for for people like me who may not be experts in what you're and what you're writing about, and so sections of this proposal need to be written with that in mind, with the fact that you're communicating with a 
non-expert in mind. So things like the, the background to your project, the introduction to it, that's a great opportunity to write for someone like me to explain what is this and why is it important? Same is true towards the end of the application when there's a section where we encourage, or the end of the proposal story, where there's a section where we encourage you to answer why Fulbright. That's a great, that's the section that I'm gonna be paying the most attention to when I read. I'm not gonna be ignoring the rest of it, but when you're going into depth about how you're going to engage in your methodology, some of that's not going to be for me. And, and, and I'm not going to be thinking about it as much when I assess it because I have experts who are reviewing it and their feedback will inform my feedback. These are all Fulbright alums who will be reading it. But when it comes to the why Fulbright piece, that's going to be where someone like I am, someone like me is paying a lot of attention to how important is the Fulbright award to you? Uh, how transformative is it going to be? How much are you engaging with Fulbright's mission and its values? And these are all things you can find on our website. So I encourage you to do that research before applying. And also think about its relevance to the award you're applying for. If you're applying for a, um, for a, a specific scholarship award, uh, this will be a section where we kind of get to delve into that. So for instance, um, with, with Catherine's project proposal, it simply wouldn't be possible without the archives that you're going to be in in the Smithsonian. So that's a why, why Fulbright, why America, why the Smithsonian were all covered by that justification. And, and you went into more depth than just being like, I only, I, I need these archives or else I can't do it. But it's thinking about things like that. How are you making your application compelling to a reader? And in terms of communicating uh, some ideas that that a non-expert would be unfamiliar with, um, have you got have you got any insight into that side? Yeah, um, I think um, when I was writing the the, the project outline, um, I used all the headings um, that, that had been provided in the application material and sort of used those as sub subsections, which perhaps goes without saying. Um, but I also think there's probably I imagine that everybody's applications are different. So in my case, the section on background that you've mentioned before, Sam, ended up being um, rather a lengthy section compared to some of the others. And I don't imagine that's necessarily the case for, for everybody. But for me, the, the background bit was just as Sam has, has um, explained. It was about creating a hook. It was about speaking. Um, it, it's a difficult balance, right? Because it's about speaking to an expert audience who you imagine at the peer review um, panel, but also um, speaking to a more general audience who, who wants to know why you're interested in, in Fulbright and why they should give you any money. So um, my advice would be that I, I read the, the Fulbright mission, I looked at the Fulbright website, I looked at who had received um, uh, scholar awards in the past, and I sort of tried to thread some of that understanding throughout the whole application. So not only the section that says why Fulbright, although that's where you double down on, on that kind of um, stuff, but all, all the way through and tried to um, show how my project was uh, it would, would certainly benefit me to be able to do it, but also how it would uh, benefit my home institution, how it would benefit my hosts in the USA, how it would enable public engagement um, and, and so on. And, and I did include some citations of academic sources in that section, but perhaps not as many as I have done in some other funding applications. So you would need to do that, I think, to establish to situate your your project um, within existing scholarship but that's not as i understand sam that's not exactly what what the um the, the panel is looking for that they, they need some indication of that but it's not necessarily going to be checking every single citation that you include there yeah i, I, I think it's yeah I, I i think it's important to say that the academic review panel will be looking for those in in say like when we get into the methodology and the um some of the, the more academic sections of that proposal, but in the background, it's very much about, as you say, establishing context, uh, telling us why we should care about your project. And, and as you say, weaving in some of that Fulbrightness as well. Um, but also uh, you, you don't necessarily need to get every citation in there because there is a section to include a bibliography, yeah. um, which academic reviewers will be paying attention to as well. You know, this is, uh, in a way, also a little bit of a shortened literature review as well, talking about what the scholarship so far has done in your area or um, 
as is often the case with Fulbright Awards, what it's not done and, and why it's important that this research is done now. One of the other things we're looking at in terms of it as a project proposal is very much the project element. So again, whilst the methodology might go over my head, the, uh, the way that you're communicating how you're going to do it in terms of what you've asked for in terms of grant is important. So how long you need to be in the US to, to do that bit of your project what each month of your grant might look like. Um, and, and this can be, you know, this month, here are some bullet points, how I'm going to achieve it in, in longer text. Uh, some people include Gantt charts in their, um, in their application. So thinking about that project management side of it, um, even if it does sound a little bit more functional over form and, and showing off that you know your area really well, it is important because we are offering a, a grant here and we need to be assured that you're able to do the, the project that we're funding. And so showing that you've understood what your project entails and how you're going to carry it out effectively is a really important part of this too. And, and that should be communicated clearly as well. And you can, as I said, we've got charts, you can use bullet points, whatever it is that you can do to make this clear and, and understandable and look like you've got an effective plan in place, do that. Whatever your preferred communication method for doing that effectively is, make sure you're doing it because we're we're paying a lot of attention to that section in every application. And, and oftentimes, if you're applying for a shorter term grant, so something like a, a three or four months, that's not long to carry out a, a large project. So if you've said something that sounds really grand and uh, like you're shaking up the whole field and then haven't included how you're going to do that in, in three months, then it's a little bit less convincing um, than if you've given us a really clear outline of what each bit of your research looks like. Um, I've seen that we had a question on, uh, do you accept applications for funding for a period of research in a larger project? We do, but we would ask you to include how the grant would fit into that larger, how the time in the US would fit into like larger research. So if you're, for instance, going out to an archive, what do your months before and after your trip look like as well? How does this research that you're doing in, a, in, an, in an archive impact the rest of your research surrounding it if you're partaking in a longer project? So think about that as well as part of your project proposal. Um, we also have a, to the sections in the guidance need to be subheadings. You can include subheadings in your project proposal. And, and I would uh, in fact say that as a great example of what what makes a clear uh, scholar program proposal is having those subheadings throughout. So like like I said, we ask you to include things like why Fulbright and justification for residence in the US. Because those are the sections that I'm paying attention to, if you clearly label those, it means that I'm I'm not getting lost in the uh, in in the application itself where I'm like, is this academic? Is this an important section to read? And it helps clearly delineate which bits of the application are, are trying to tick which boxes. Uh, I think Catherine said a really, really crucial thing when she said, try and weave that Fulbright side of things throughout the project proposal. But at the same time, if you're, if you're making clear delineations of which bit of the application to read for which information, that's clear communication. I think that's the heart of what we've been trying to get through today is, is be clear and, and communicate well. So absolutely do that. Um, we've got some other questions, but they're a little bit less um, core to the section. So we'll, we'll come to those in the end when we have time for questions. Our next bit after the proposal is your letter of support from your institution. I've already said that this doesn't need to be a letter at this stage, or it doesn't need to have uh, your dates in it, for instance, at this stage. It can just be evidence for uh, any communication you've had with that institution so far if you don't have official affiliation yet. But what I will say is we are still paying attention to it. So whilst you need it to be eligible, it's not like uh, a good letter of, of affiliation doesn't catch our attention. If your host institution seems excited by your research and excited to work with you, that's going to be something that, that catches our eye. And so Make sure if, if it is an academic colleague, for instance, that you're, you're reaching out to to work with, make sure you're, you're building that relationship because in some cases you're gonna be working in the same department with, with some of these people for a year. So I think it's just good advice to be cordial and, uh, and, and professional with people 
early on. But also, if if they're enthusiastic about your project, then that enthusiasm if that enthusiasm is reflected on the application when we read it. And and I I can't stress enough how important building that affiliation at this stage, even even now, is because they could be hosting you from anywhere from three months to, to 12 months. So having a good relationship early is going to be really important. Were there any steps that you took when reaching out to, to the Smithsonian that, that you felt would, would carry over to, to other people? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Well, I, actually, my situation was a little bit different because I had no contacts whatsoever at the Smithsonian before I thought about the, the Fulbright application. So at the same time as you're emphasising those kind of kind of building those contacts and having people who, who know you, I also would say don't be discouraged if, if you don't have existing networks. I simply uh, I spent some time um, reading the information that Fulbright provided about the key personnel in each area of the Smithsonian and reached out to some people and explained about my project. And, and they there were affiliations, uh, links with what they were doing. And I sort of was careful to point those out to them. So people knew I'd researched them and was impressed by their work. And then I found, and I think this would be the true in most cases, that people are really uh, flattered and, and enthusiastic about being approached. Um, and the Fulbright is obviously really prestigious. And um, there's there's a lot of brand name recognition in the USA as well. So people will know what you're talking about and will will feel uh, honoured uh, and excited that you're reaching out to them. So, so yes, I think if you already have networks and people can write about your personal qualities, um, great. But it didn't hold me back that they they don't they've still not met me personally, right? So they, they might change their minds when I get there. <laughs> but so far, they've provided these kind of um, supportive uh, statements. And and that um, that is is something to to really emphasise. This doesn't need to be a pre existing relationship. Uh, you can form an, a brand new relationship as part of this and. Uh, reach out to people, as, as Catherine says, Fulbright is a big name in the US and it's a big deal. And you may even get that enthusiasm from a group of people who have never met you before because you want to do your Fulbright in their department. And, and, I, and I can't stress that enough that it, it will be a big deal to them. Uh, the other side of this is uh, we're now into sort of 18 months, two years of, of doing a lot of virtual collaboration, virtual connection with people and so, uh, it may be that if you're reaching out to people for the first time, they'll be more willing to set up a, a call over Zoom, over Teams, something like that. So you can actually start to get to know people who perhaps you haven't worked with or met at conferences before and, and take advantage of the fact that uh, the, the world is a lot more open to online collaboration these days. And that may actually feed into your project in the preliminary stages. So see if people are willing to, to have conversations with you rather than just emails at this stage, because that might help with your application and they may even be able to answer questions that make your proposal a little bit stronger too. Yeah, that, that's a good point as well, Sam, that, that when you um, start the dialogue with your prospective hosts, that can only enrich your application because little tidbits of information they give you. I found out, for example, um, that where I wanted to go was undergoing enormous renovations and then um, and I sort of included that as a reassurance in, in the proposal to say that although these renovations were taking place the Smithsonian would still be able to offer me um, office space and so on. Now I don't know how what level of detail the panelists were looking for there but it sort of provides that sense that you're in control that you've got contingency plans that you're familiar with what's happening at the place that yep. you're proposing to go to. And, and, and it can also feed into um, the, that research in other ways. So for instance, you might have a conversation with someone and find out that their research is actually working really nicely with what you're proposing to do. And then um, when we talked about that justification for, for why you need to be in the US or um, why Fulbright, it's another great opportunity to say, it turns out this is really timely with what's going on in my department. And that's gonna look really good to us that you've engaged in that cross-cultural dialogue already with with an American institution and you're engaging in that Fulbright mission side of things even before you've started on the Fulbright within uh, because it's within that application stage. After your letter from your host uh, we ask for three letters of recommendation and this is the last real bit of the application before you head on over to our website to fill out our supplemental form and hit submit on both. Uh, for these letters of recommendation we need three from people who, who know you and you feel would write good references or recommendations of you. 
Uh, the one tip that I want to give uh, before perhaps Catherine could talk about picking the people that you want to, to write your, your letters is sometimes you get people who get a recommendation letter from the host institution. I'm not going to say don't do that if, if that's someone you've worked closely with and you think would write a good recommendation for you. But we've also said we, we like when there's good affiliation letters. So don't limit yourself to really only having three data points on your application if you're choosing your host institution as one of your recommendation letters. You will have that affiliation letter from your host institution talking about why they're excited to work with you. You can have three recommendation letters from three different people to that. That gives us four data points instead of three. And I think it's a really compelling area of your application, in fact, to not have your host institution write one of your recommendation letters because it shows a wider wider network, wider impact. It shows that, that more people have faith in you and your project than just the host institution, perhaps your home institution. So really try and find three people who aren't affiliated with your, with your hosts when it comes to getting those letters of recommendation, because we've already heard from them. So, so it, it's helpful for us and, and is more competitive in my mind to have three different voices uh, than just your hosts support your application. Uh, Catherine, do you, do you want to talk a little bit about how to how to reach out to people and perhaps um, who you thought was able to provide a good insight on what? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Again, I, I followed the advice um, that was in the guidance that said it was it was preferable to have somebody who could comment very sort of personally on on your on your work rather than sort of big name people who maybe didn't know you very well um, if at all. So I contacted three people that I'd worked with closely, someone I'd co-published with, uh, you know, who, who knew a lot about my my interests and my capabilities. I asked um, the professor of my uh, current department because she could talk a lot about what I'd been doing recently and stuff about leadership um, qualities um, and so on. And then somebody um, who I'd, um, who sort of followed my career um, from, from when I was a young early career researcher and they talked a bit I think about the well I actually I've not read the references but let's hope they did this they talked about the sort of progress um, of my my research um, career so um, I chose people from three different institutions um, as Sam has said um, not not all from the same place and not from my host um, institution and when I approached them um, again, I, I think it's important to remember that most people um, in, in the UK and in, in Europe do, do know what Fulbright is. You know, it, it's incredibly famous and prestigious outside of the USA. So explaining that that's what I was going for, I think people were very keen to, to write me references. There wasn't any kind of uh, reluctance um, uh, to do that. And you have to you have to um, shepherd them as well a bit because there is a certain date and a process by which they have to submit their references and so I made sure that my prospective referees were really clear about that up front so they knew when they had to submit the reference reference by and how to do so. Yeah yeah I think that's really clear that the deadline is the same as your deadline and and that they should be working on this as soon as possible because it is a required step in the application to have all three of those so yeah be clear with them and be cordial but be firm I think is the <laughs> Um, so that's that's it. Once you've done that, once you've completed the supplemental form, that's it. You've submitted your application, and uh, then it's it's over to our academic panelists and to us uh, at the Fulbright Commission to read. Where our academic panelists will be looking at the viability of the project, the academic strength of it, and um, using their experience as alumni to, to think about the Fulbright aspects of it. We at the Fulbright Commission will be looking at sort of the logistical parts of it and those Fulbright qualities that I've talked about before. So thinking about your cultural engagement, your curiosity, your leadership qualities and, and your wider impact as well. These are all things that we're going to be thinking about. So, so make sure to include those in your project and make sure that you're thinking about those in terms of your CV and things like that. Those are the aspects that we're going to be looking at. And our, our academic reviewers will be experts in their in your fields and in theirs. So make sure that you're not dumbing the application down for 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 a general audience uh, because it will be experts reading it. Uh, but once you've got all these elements together, use that checklist on the application instructions and then head on over to the supplemental form, fill that out, click submit on both, and uh, and we'll have your application and. Uh, 
after November 8th on that after that deadline, we'll we'll get to reading it and making sure the academic reviewers can read it. Uh, we've got some time for questions if you've got any, so we will work through those. And whilst we give people time to submit their questions, Catherine, is there anything that I've missed that you think is really helpful for people to know? Um, no, I think you've covered it all really well, Sam. If I didn't attend a webinar before I uh, did my application, and now having heard this one, I wish I had, because things about the sections, the time management, the supplemental forms, the, the word uh, limits on the form, uh, the use of subheadings, all, all these things um, are really important in order to be able to organise the application and get it in on time. If you don't read the guidance properly, um, you'll have a surprise at the end and realise something's due in the next day and you've not done it. So, um, yeah, ca careful, careful reading and paying attention to the guidance is the, the key key bit of advice I have. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to our, offer some insight on some of these questions as well. Okay. Um, so got a question on uh from someone who is a final year undergraduate um and a few questions that i think would relate to their application so if you're an undergraduate and you're not eligible for some of our awards that don't require a phd um so you're looking to do an academic award um and you're finishing your undergraduate i actually recommend you go and look at our postgraduate awards so these awards are just for the awards that we've been talking about today and the application guidance we've been talking about today is just for our uk scholar awards so those are for academics and professionals um, who are looking to do three 12 months worth of research or teaching in the US. If you're currently an undergraduate, it's more likely you want to look at our postgraduate awards. Um, so you can find a lot of information on our website. My colleague Angelina has done lots of webinars like this as well. So you'll be able to find information on our YouTube channel to help you out with your application there. Um, but do, do you make sure you're applying for the right award and award category when you're filling out the application? Because uh, a lot of the information from tonight will, won't necessarily have been as relevant to you if you're applying for a postgraduate award. Uh, so I just want to make that clear there. Uh, so is it okay to submit an application if you're an early career researcher and not currently affiliated with a UK academic institution? Absolutely. Um, you're going to be in the US for the, the time that you're there. So having a UK home institution isn't always the case for our academics who are out there. And in fact, um, some of our, because our awards are open to UK citizens, sometimes they're not based in the UK at the moment. So um, I've got a scholar who should be going to the US early in 2021, who's currently uh, working out of a European university rather than a UK one. So, um, I, and others who are perhaps not necessarily employed by a university right now, um, so don't let not having a, a home institution at this stage be a be a barrier. Um, it's 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 simply not that if you're looking for an affiliation with the university right now, what we're looking for is is a US one. So just just make sure you're focusing your attention on that rather than uh, your UK home institution. Uh, I have a question on a project affiliated with two institutions. Um, I would think about how much you're affiliated with those institutions. So if, if it's a long project where you would be spending two time, uh, time hosted by both, um, then you may want to include both of them. Or it might be that you're working with some people at one of them whilst being hosted full time at the other. So think about realistically what, what your uh, logistics in the US would be like. Um, but being affiliated with two institutions has happened before, although it is very rare. So really, uh, I, I don't want to encourage um, or discourage you either way, but I, I'd, pay, I'd spend some time thinking about which institution is your primary host, if that's the case, or, or how does this work logistically with your time in the US? Um, because communicating that well um, is going to still be important to your application. But if you need to be at both, do you include both and do you communicate with both at this stage? And you can include that in the work plan as well, can't you, Sam? Yeah, in, yeah, uh, in the pro project outline where you're asked to give a sort of a schedule, you might want to indicate that in certain months you might be predominantly with one institution rather than the other and, and vice versa. So I imagine that if that's a compelling description of the use of your time, then that wouldn't be something that would, would be detrimental to the application in mm -hmm. any sense. Um, for references for uh, postgraduate research or early career researchers, can an applicant put down their PhD supervisor? Yes, 
and they would likely know your work very well. So I imagine they would be a good person to include in your, uh, your application. Uh, someone has asked about the Fulbright uh, on the application website, which application type should one use for a scholar award? I only see the Fulbright foreign student program. Uh, you should be able to see the Fulbright visiting scholar program. If not, please email me uh, or email the Fulbright programs account, um, but make sure you're following the link from the Fulbright scholar award page on the Fulbright website. So um, if, if you're following it from the student page, that might be what's happening. But if there is an issue, please do email us there. Um, are references being asked about the project or the applicant or both? I would think both. Did you um, ask, did you, how did you, did you send them your proposal as you were working on it? Yeah. Did you talk about what your project was? How did you uh, engage with your referees in terms of what you were asking them to write about? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, some people who are my referees, I worked closely with, so they were aware of the whole plan and, and saw various stages of my proposal and I discussed it with them. Um, some people who weren't perhaps as closely related to, to my daily you know, work, um, I sent them the proposal and, and asked if they uh, let them know that that's what I was asking them to support um, so they could have a look at the proposal draft before they agreed to, to write the reference. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's both things. I think they're commenting about you, but also um, if you can enthuse them with your proposal outline, um, and they think that that's important and significant, they're more likely to be able to write a really enthusiastic, compelling reference for you. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. Um, are footnotes included in the 3,500 word count and should these follow a particular reference system? So I don't know about the word count um, because we don't host the application form, but I would be cautious if they are. Um, I think it's often the case that footnotes are included in in that word count. Um, yeah, they, they they are some because um, it, it, it's the the pages, I think, are what the system uh, okay. counts. And, and so I think if you can get them onto your five pages, that would be fine, but that's going to take up a lot of space that you'll want to dedicate mm -hmm. to, to narrative. So um, I, I use the Harvard system, if that's uh, any, any help to anybody, um, but there wasn't an indication of which system that, that you should use. Yeah, we, we have no preference in um, in terms of what we're reading application wise. Um, I have personal preference, but it's not going to influence my uh, my reading of, of your applications. Um, but um, be sure to just write what you're used to and what, what you're comfortable with. Uh, could you elaborate on the sections on community involvement and life outside of academia? What are your expectations? Um, so. Uh, perhaps I'll talk a little bit about what we're looking to see, and then maybe you could talk a little bit about what you said. So um, what I'm looking for is, is evidence that you have these things. Um, for community involvement, what is it that you do that is impactful within your institution, but also outside of your institution? So in terms of um, how, do you, how do you work within your academic community and your institution, are you... Um, involved in supporting your academic community anyway do you support your students in a specific way things like that but also then outside of the outside of the academy how do you engage as a person what are you involved with um because us higher education uh cares a lot more about the um applicant and the person as a as a complete person than just their academic achievements um this is particularly true at undergraduate, but carries up through the entire stage of, uh, or through every stage of, of academia in the US. There's a lot of focus on, on the holistic applicant. And uh, in the same way, we want to know who you are, not just what it is that you work on. And so that's kind of what that community involvement page is about. We're interested in your, in your ambassadorial qualities, what it is that you do that shows sort of leadership, care for a community, the ways that you you work with other people and, and, and consider other people. And then, and, and life outside of academia is part of that too. Um, but if you have interesting hobbies, you can include those there too. And we're also interested in the way that you'll transfer that across the pond into the US because Fulbright awards aren't just about the research. They're about what, what you're learning from the US, the ways that you're embedding yourself in another culture. And so this is a good way to talk about what it is that you as a person are interested in and how you're going to engage with that in the US. 
and because the US is a different culture, it's a, a, a with different communities, it's a good place to talk about perhaps things that you've not had the chance to do in the UK as well. So we're looking at we're looking at lots of different ways that you could approach that because everyone is different and has different ways that they engage with their communities and and ways that they uh, promote their work or or who they are outside of their work. Um, but we're also really interested in that key aspect of of how you'll engage with that in in the US as well. Hmm. Yeah, I, I focused. I think community involvement. I, I focused a lot on on academic leadership and things that I would bring back to my home institution and the way that the Fulbright Award wouldn't only benefit me, but would benefit my whole home institution in terms of making links with the host institution. Maybe that might benefit my students. My research would enable me to offer um, updated teaching um, and the, the, the stuff that was more about um, academic uh, interests outside of academia, in my case, um, I did link them to my project, so I'm interested in visual culture, and I talked about um, certainly some of the ways that I might extend the project after the Fulbright Award to link up with certain organisations and make positive changes, um, but also how I'd use the, the, the downtime um, in the US to sort of broaden those interests. And basically, I, I, I'm really interested in visiting some of the other Smithsonian uh, galleries um, that I'm not going to actually be based at for my my research um, to to you know broaden my understanding of U.S. Uh, visual culture and, and art history. So I think you can, uh, but I know I know other people who were successful talked about uh, getting involved with baseball, um, with, with sports. With um, I believe someone was interested in craft craft ale, the U.S. microbrewery scene. Um, so I, I don't I don't think um, that Fulbright is looking for everything to be wonderfully perfectly linked to your application but to show that you've got a healthy broad interest in exploring u.s culture and, and sharing ideas and cultural interchange it's a it's a part of the application where you can put some personality in and mm -hmm. and and that's a that's a good thing to do we we don't want to we, we want to encourage you to use this as an opportunity to put some of you into your application and say this is a space in which you can do it and and on that note uh Thanks both for your presentation. I'm writing the why Fulbright section. Could you give some tips on what to include in that section? Um, so this is another great opportunity to, to put some personality into the application. Um, first of all, read about Fulbright on the website. Read about our vision, our mission statement, our strategic plan, things like that on the website, and think about how those might apply to your project. But also think about why you need to be in the US, um, why this, uh, this project perhaps is bigger than just research, what, what it is that you would gain from your time in the US, what it is that your institution might gain from your time in the US. Um, all of these things are relevant to the Y4, right? Say, for instance, um, a recent scholar, granted it was a larger part of his project, but it was a, a key part as well of the Y4, right? Used his time in the US to set up an ongoing virtual collaboration between his students and students at a US institution. And that's a really, for him, that wasn't really doable without the Fulbright. It was him being there in person to start that collaboration. It was the name of Fulbright. It was uh, being part of that larger project initially to open that door. So you think about what it is that being a part of something bigger than just the academia will have on your project, but also the, like I've, I've said the word logistics a lot, but why do you need to be in America um, is, is a part of this too. And, and how does your being in an institution and being part of this community of, of Fulbright scholars impact your project? Yeah, that, I, I'd agree uh, with that, Sam. It, it, was a, it was a case of uh, reiterating the absolute crucial need to be in the US, because I, I think if, if you're wavering on that, if it's research or, or teaching that you could do elsewhere, I, I think you're probably, uh, you, you know, de it's detrimental to your application. So why, why be in the US? Why is that so important? And, and what like sort of Fulbright citizenship as well like what might you like to contribute to the Fulbright um, uh, commission if, if you were successful you'll become part of a lifelong community and how can you give back um, and, and be enthusiastic about doing that yeah for sure for sure uh, one more question uh, which we have which is at this at what stage do you need a formal invitation letter from your host institution 
I recommend it before clicking submit on your application, although it is not entirely necessary. Um, what is absolutely necessary is evidence of communication with your host institution. But if you can get a formal invitation, do so. Um, but if you are successful at the application stage, we will ask for a formal invitation letter with, with dates of your grant and when they expect you there uh, within the, the time that you're on the program. Uh, certainly before you uh, your grant authorization is issued. So it's something we require soon after, after your successful application. Um, I, I do wanna add the note that this can change if, if personal circumstances change, or for instance, if there are global circumstances that affect your ability to travel like a, like a pandemic, then we would, uh, we're more than happy to have your dates and your invitation change. Um, but uh, ideally, sooner rather than later, uh, if you can't get one, just make sure you're communicating with your host and, and able to show evidence of communication. Uh, Uh, so, um, someone here has just said uh, that they're presently between formal roles, and so bringing back something to a UK institution isn't necessarily certain, but they will continue to to seek to do that. Um, is this okay or not enough for US UK building bridges? Absolutely. Um, if you have ideas in which you will be able to do that, and and think about as well this opportunity to potentially bridge communities that aren't just your yeah. your academic ones. It's not just about your your host institution, for instance, um, it could be what um, what you'll learn or, or ways that you'll integrate with communities out there, ways that you can continue to um, increase your civic engagement, uh, both in the UK and the US. So it's not just about your, your employer when it comes to this. And uh, with that, I will uh, close questions for now. If you have any more, please do email our programs account. You'll be able to find that on the contact us email address. Uh, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Catherine for joining us this evening and, and offering her wisdom to the uh, to the application stage. Thank you so much for, for being here tonight. Yeah, thanks, Sam, and good luck to everybody who does go through with the application. Um, it, it's, it's a really challenging but enjoyable process. And thank you to all of you for, for spending an hour with us on this uh, dismal October evening. Um, I hope you have a great evening lined up ahead of you and a, and a great week and good luck with your applications if you if you do choose to, to apply and submit them and uh, I, even if you've not studied yet I encourage you to do so because there is still time so thank you all and uh, and good luck um, that I will end the webinar.